The concepts that I want to introduce you to are basically these. The idea of map projections, of ellipsoids, of geodetic datums, and of coordinate systems. <coughs> map projections are trying to put a 3D world into a 2D map. To do so, we have to stretch and disform our original to try and make a representation of it. So all of these diagrams intend to show different ways in which that might be done. All of them suggest that what we really want is a light bulb at some point of reference, and we follow the light rays from that point to figure out where on a projected map, just as if it was on this screen and my light bulb was out there, if I pass it through some kind of a shape, where do the points end up? So here's one where I put a light bulb in the middle of a cylinder. And when I do that, I get a map that looks like that. Here I put a light bulb way out to the side of my sphere and I get some map like this projected. And here's another representation of the same one. To help you get an idea of the kinds of things that projections do, here's a picture of a room as it would appear using this Lambert azimuthal equal area projection. This is what the map of the Earth looks like and you can see that there are distortions out to the side. You can see it more readily, it, it's kind of easier to put in your brain when you look at a room and all the things that happen to the room. We're distorting it. And we're distorting it so we can put it on a flat surface. So that's one example. Here's another one. This is an example for the most commonly seen projection in the world because this is what Google Maps uses and all other online mapping systems. So this is what a Mercator projection looks like for the Earth and that's what it looks like for the, for the room. It's quite distorted around the edges. The shapes are conserved. You can see Africa looks like Africa. Antarctica, you can recognize the border of Africa, but the clo sorry, Antarctica, the closer you get to the poles, the more distorted it gets. And just to get your head around it, this is what would happen to a head that was projected in four different projections. You can see how in this Mercator example, the neck gets quite broadened out. This one is fairly normal. All kinds of different things can happen to the head. The important thing to notice or use in your georeferencing is understanding that you want to use maps where the distances are preserved on the map. There are different kinds of projections that do that. Others that preserve areas. This one, for example, preserves areas. And you can see that latitude gets broader and broader as you go north or south. Whereas this kind of a projection is an equal distance projection. No matter where you are on the map, if you measure this direction or this direction or this direction, it's always kept correct. That's not true in a Mercator projection. You really notice it over longer distances. So be aware of that. An ellipsoid is a way to describe the surface of the Earth which is not an ellipsoid. So this solid line here is meant to depict an ellipsoid that estimates as a sort of simple model for what the shape of the Earth should be when in fact the shape of the Earth is bumpy. Now this is obviously a huge exaggeration in this picture, but the truth of the matter is that the surface of the Earth doesn't follow the rules the mathematical rules, the simple rules. Here are a couple examples of names of ellipsoids. So the idea then behind the ellipsoids, and there are m many of them, you would think, okay, why not just use one ellipsoid to describe the surface of the Earth? Use the best one. The problem is that if you're mapping just your country, 
the best possible ellipsoid for you isn't necessarily the same as the best possible ellipsoid for someone else. And so what happens is you end up with a whole set of different ellipsoids for all over the world for different uses. And the reason is that you would like your ellipse to be as close as possible matched to the surface of the Earth in that area. And because the Earth does funny things, this one ellipsoid doesn't fit all very well. So there are many of them. Geodetic datum takes that same idea one step further. So the ellipsoids are meant to try to match the whole surface of the Earth or some part of it. A datum is to take an ellipsoid and to move it from the center of the Earth one way or the other to match locally. So here we have an ellipsoid in the solid line. We have the same ellipsoid in the dotted line, but in order to match the Earth better here, we take the ellipsoid and we move it slightly in that direction. So a datum is a definition of ellipsoid that has been moved to match the surface of the Earth in some particular area. And whereas there are about 20 different ellipsoids, there are over 200 datums in the world. What, one question? I just want to know why it will move a data closer to the surface of the Earth. Why would you want to do that? Yes. Yeah, the question is why would you want to move the datum closer to the surface of the Earth? And the reason is that the closer you have a match, the better your map will be because you're not going to be projecting as much. You can imagine, let's see, how would we do this? Suppose that I have a magnifying glass right here to look at the table and the table is slightly curved. If my magnifying glass is over here, the, how that curve appears will be different than if it's sitting right on top of it. So basically what I'm doing is saying, I want to move my magnifying glass here because that allows me to see reality without distorting it as much as possible. The datum is the same idea. It's to say, locally, I want the least amount of distortion possible. So that when I draw my map, it's faithful. And I'm not misrepresenting how things really are. Other questions about that? Does that answer your question? Okay. Okay, so now here are a couple of examples of geodetic datums of those 200 and, or more. The one that you have probably seen is WGS84. This is an attempt to make a datum that fits the entire surface of the world as well as it can. <clears throat> so we're basically stepping back from the whole idea of a datum to begin with because in this day and age we have things like Google Maps where we want to see the whole world in the same coordinate system and the same coordinate reference system as well. So this single global datum was devised that minimizes the distortions all over the world. It's not necessarily the best one locally, but it's one that we can use consistently whenever we go from one place to another. It allows us to be lazy with our GPSs means we don't have to change our datum with our GPS just because we get on a plane and go somewhere. It's basically what that is. The coordinate systems themselves, the ones that we're uh, probably most familiar with are latitude and longitude. And these are called geographic coordinates. And they're a simple system of north latitudes from the equator at zero to the poles at 90 or minus 90. And then a series of longitudes in degrees as well that go from a prime meridian at zero all the way around to the opposite side at plus or minus 180. There are other systems such as the 
universal transverse Mercator system in which the coordinates are de designed to be a number of meters north or south, east or west of reference points. This is a much more complicated system. You need to know in which particular band you are before those coordinates make any sense. So it is, and also beyond a certain latitude, in this case 84 degrees north, or below or south of a certain latitude, <coughs> minus 80 in this case, there are no such coordinates. So it's not actually global. Once you get to the poles, you have to switch to a different coordinate system. You have to switch to one that is um, actually polar. It's a circle rather than numbers like this. But our latitudes and longitudes in, um, in geographic coordinates allow us to use two numbers to describe anywhere on, on our model, on our coordinate reference system. That's why the Darwin core chooses as its standard to be decimal latitude and longitude. Now we go from the geographical concepts into the georeferencing concepts. These are concepts that we need to understand in the production of our latitude, longitude, and uncertainty. The first one is the named place. That is, in our textual description, the reference point, the name of the town, or the mountain, or the river, or the junction, that's the named place. That's the thing that usually, if we're lucky, we can find coordinates for. And if we're luckier still, we can find it on a map and know how big it is. To know how big it is, is to know its extent. That's exactly what extent means. It's the size of the named place. It might even be the shape of it. Then there are two concepts that we find in a large number of locality descriptions, an offset and a heading. Examples are five kilometers north of. So in that case, the offset is the five kilometers, the heading is north. And whatever's, whatever it's in reference to is the named place. So five, so let's say 20 kilometers north of the university that we visited yes, two days ago, three days ago. It's hard to remember the days. If we go 20 kilometers north of that, 20 kilometers is the offset, north is the heading, and the university is the named place. So these are components of the textual description. And we'll use those components to determine the georeference. In addition, we have three concepts that are related to each other, but are distinct, and we need to understand the distinctions 